Okay, welcome um, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Sarah Olson um, and welcome to the Australian National Data Service Data Citation and DOIs Back to Basics workshop. We're lucky enough to have two um, experienced presenters today um, talking about data citation and DOIs. The first presenter is Jerry Ryder. Um, Jerry's going to introduce data citation and the role of DOIs in data citation. Um, and then to Liz Woods from ANS, who will be giving an overview of the ANS Cite My Data service, which is our online service um, via the ANS website to attach or assign DOIs to your research data. So Liz will explain how this works and how you can do this um, if your institution has the capacity for DOI minting. Uh, Liz will also be able to answer any technical questions that you might have about this process. So welcome to our presenters and um, all our participants, of course, and we'll get started with Jerry. Um, hi everybody, thank you for coming along today and um, it's great to see so much interest in data citation, it's a topic close to my heart. Um, what, we'll be what I'll be covering today and what I hope will be a relatively short session, I'd like to allow plenty of time for questions after both Liz and I have spoken, um, but we'll start with looking at uh, what is data citation, what is a DOI, and the relationship between DOIs and data citation and then a quick look at why we care about data citation. Um, not everyone in the audience may be familiar with ANS, so just briefly, ANS is a Commonwealth funded initiative which has been established to enable what we call the four transformations of um, data from unmanaged to managed disconnected to connected, invisible to findable and single use to reusable. And we, could, we work across the publicly funded research and data sector in Australia. You can find out more about ANS on the ANS website. Today we are talking about data citation and DOIs. You might like at some point to visit the ANS website to download this lay for poster. It actually neatly summarises a number of the concepts that, that we'll be covering today, but it also does provide some broader context um, to the topic of data citation, um, some of which we won't be able to get to in this sort of back to basic session today. But it's a, it's a nice, neat resource that you might find useful. So let's start by looking at what data citation is. Well, quite simply, data citation is the practice of providing a reference to data in the same way that researchers routinely provide a reference to other outputs in their papers, such as journal articles, reports and conference papers. And this is done for the same purpose for data as it is for other scholarly outputs. That's to acknowledge the use of materials or resources and to provide enough information to enable others to verify and access the resource. And in this example, um, where I've just blown up the actual um, citation, you can see that um, a data set has been formally cited in the reference section of this um, uh, journal article. And you can see that the structure of it is probably fairly similar to um, other types of references. So just stepping back a little bit, it's probably fair to say that within the scholarly community it has been and to some extent continues to be common practice for research data to be shared informally between colleagues. Until relatively recently there were few mechanisms for actually publishing research data to make it more broadly available. Mostly it was stored on local servers or perhaps a USB stick in the bottom drawer. So it's probably not surprising that there wasn't a real concept of formal data citation. However, now there are a growing number of mechanisms for publishing data and on the screen now you can see just a few examples. And these have really evolved to support um, global data-driven research, uh, but have also served to raise the profile of research data as a first-class research output rather than as a byproduct of research. When research is written up in papers, it's been common practice for data sources to be included in the acknowledgements of a paper or referred to in the methods section. 
but this is now changing and actually quite rapidly. Like other types of scholarly outputs, there needs to be a standardised way of referencing data and there are with standards now emerging and we know that publishers are looking at how data citation can be incorporated into their instructions for authors. And this slide is really just intended, I guess, to show perhaps the evolution of data citation, where previously it's been important really just for perhaps the owner of the data to know where their data is and what it is, whereby these sort of brief descriptions, if you call them that, uh, were perhaps good enough. Whereas now where we're talking more formal citation and sharing, what we need to see is something that's more useful um, to allow for the discovery of data and the access to data. And my apologies to Pat and Ross, who I'm sure have never done anything like on the left hand side of the screen. So here we see the same data set professionally published um, through the um, Griffith University Research Hub. And you can see that there's a nice clear statement, uh, data citation statement. And while it's covered down here, I think on your, where you can see the blue circle, where it's covered in the actual record for this particular data set, I've just blown up the actual citation so that you can see it in a bit more detail. So it's been, as I said, professionally published with an with a very clear statement um, of attribution uh, that can be used in a reference list like we saw previously. Uh, here's the same citation, uh, just blown up a little bit more so you can um, see it in a bit more detail. Again, very similar format to what we saw in that first slide where the uh, data set was referenced in the paper. But what I sort of also wanted to have a look at here is this DOI that's appended to the end of the citation. So the DOI is a digital object identifier and we'll have a look at these in a bit more detail um, shortly. But I, I guess what I wanted to introduce here is the clarification that while DOIs are considered best practice for data citation, they're not essential for data citation. They're two different but related concepts. Um, authors can certainly cite their own data or data from other sources that they've reused in their papers without a DOI. For example, using a URL or a handle to link to the data or a detailed description of the data. In this example from Research Data Australia, you can see that a handle has been used in the citation rather than a DOI. So there's the indication of how the data should be cited if reused and this number here is actually the uh, handle that's been assigned, essentially a URL. So I just wanted to clarify there that these are two concepts that are related but not necessarily interdependent. Now let's have a look at DOIs in a little bit more detail. DOIs or digital object identifiers are globally unique identifiers that can be assigned to various resource types including research data and journal articles and I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with their use in journal article citations. They provide easy and persistent access to research data and to other resource types that they're assigned to. Some terminology, DOIs are minted and are resolvable. So by minting, we mean creating a DOI and attaching it to a record that describes research data. And by resolvable, we mean being able to click on the DOI as a link and have it resolve or take you to the metadata page that describes the data, including how to access the data itself. Minting a, a DOI implies a long-term commitment to maintain the resource it's assigned to. So this is to ensure that anyone clicking on a DOI doesn't receive, receive the dreaded 404 message. So the minter of a DOI needs to commit to keeping the DOI and associated metadata page current. So for example, if there is a server upgrade and 
and the data or metadata is moved, the DOI must be updated so that it remains current and persistent. DOI is also important in that they support automated tracking of reuse of data, which is sometimes known as, or now becoming known as, data citation metrics. This works in pretty much the same way as citation metrics for other scholarly outputs such as journal articles. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with products like Web of Knowledge and Scopus that track citation metrics for journal articles. Well, there are similar services now emerging for tracking data citations. And these services largely rely on machine matching of citations. So standard citation formats and the use of DOIs make this process more reliable and accurate. You'll see DOIs presented in various formats. In some cases, as in the top example here, you will see the name, you might see the name of an organization or a data repository embedded in the DOI. But in most cases, they're essentially a pretty meaningless but unique machine readable string. As you can see here, there's no real pattern to, to this, uh, except that it's the important bit is that it is globally unique. So how do you go about getting DOIs assigned to research data? Well, ANS offers the Cite My Data service, which Liz will talk about in more detail shortly. It's a service that's offered free to Australian publicly funded research organisations who wish to assign DOIs to research data, software or workflows. And when I say free, I guess it's probably fair to say that it's at no cost to you to mint. There is, of course, still the associated cost of the long-term maintenance of the DOI and the associated resources. Uh, just before we move on to hearing more about the service, I just wanted to quickly cover why we care about data citation and DOIs. Well, data citation is becoming accepted scholarly practice. As data is increasingly being recognised as a first-class research output, it's only fair and reasonable that it's appropriately, appropriately acknowledged and potentially rewarded. It's also fair to say that journals are now embracing data citation. Some of you may be aware that PLOS recently announced a new data policy which requires authors to formally publish the data associated with submitted journal articles. And what we can see here is the publisher community increasingly coming on board with the concept of publishing data and by association a requirement to cite data. We can also see that research funding will have more emphasis on data access and reuse. Some of you may be aware that the ARC earlier this year released new funding rules that encourage researchers to, and I'm using their words, consider the ways in which they can best manage, store, disseminate and reuse data generated through ARC funded research. So again, data access, data reuse really implies data citation, acknowledging the origins of that data. And in the future, what we can, I guess, see in our crystal ball is that um, scholarly metrics are likely to include citations to data. So in the same way that researchers and institutions are now often asked to provide uh, statistics and data around reuse of journal publications through citation metrics, there's a the potential for the same sort of metrics to apply to data. And the tools are emerging now to enable this. And Thomson Reuters, who run the Web of Knowledge platform, which is commonly used for citation metrics for journal articles, are first off the rank with a commercial service offering in this area with the release of the Data Citation Index in 2012. And finally, a key thing is the DOIs and the assignment of DOIs as best practice for persistent access to data products. So I just wanted to finish up with this data citation readiness checklist. 
Unfortunately, we don't have time today to go into this in any great detail, but you might find it a useful reference to come back to and hopefully ANS may run some events in the future that will go beyond the basics and start to address some of these issues in a bit more detail. And I'd like to thank Dave Connell from the Australian Antarctic Data Centre for sharing this. The AAD were early adopters of DOIs and data citation and so have a lot of experience that they have happily shared with others in the community who wish to go forward in this area. So that's it for me and I'll hand over to Liz now to talk about the and Cite My Data service. Great good afternoon everyone. Thanks Jerry. Now I'm going to um, give you a brief overview of a service that Anne's offers called Cite My Data. You'll normally come in to um, us and ask for this service after you've been through Jerry's checklist. You've identified the fact that you have data that is citable, that you have a data management system that allows you to identify how to cite that data and that you're willing to take on the persistence of keeping that data. And what the Ant Cite My Data service does, it enables research organisations to assign the DOIs to research data sets or collections. What needs to be noted is it's a machine to machine service. Uh, a researcher cannot sign on to ANS to use a service and fill out a form to obtain a DOI. An organisation makes an agreement with ANS to be able to access our service from one of their machines to us. Um, the clients embed the service usually within their data management workflows. Um, when they've identified that yes, they have data they want to keep, that they have the information about that data and they're storing it in their own university repositories, that's when, with inside that automated workflow, they'll probably access our data to obtain a DOI to go along with the other information they have about their data. Um, it is not accessible for individual researchers to use. We have, however, developed, um, Site data has been around for a couple of years, we've now developed a user interface for organisations to access, to be able to list the DOIs that have been minted for their organisation and to perform various other functions on those DOIs. At this point, and there is no talk of definitely in the future that it will happen, there is no talk of us having that interface available to actually mint a DOI. Now, more information about Site My Data and Anne's approach to it can be found at the sitemydata.html at ands.org.au. Now, to describe where we fit in, ANS, amongst the organisations and within the global aspect of the DOI system, the, digital, the DOI system, the Digital Object Identifier, it provides a framework for persistent identification. It's based on the handle system, which is an ISO international standard. In order to provide DOI minting services that integrate with this global system, an organisation must be registered as a registry agency. Now, ANS is a member of an established international registration agency called DataCite. And as a member of DataCite, we can now register data centres with DataCite. Once registered, those data centres can then mint DOIs. Now, a data centre, for our purposes, roughly equates to an organisation or an institution, um, a university, CSIRO, that would be classed as a data centre. The ANS Site My Data Machine to Machine service utilises the DOI services offered through our membership with DataCite, but we also add a layer of our own administration and business logic to the organisations that are minting through us. Now, if more information on DataCite, and it is worth a read because it describes not only DataCite and its organisation, but the importance of data citation quite well, that can be found at www.datacite.org. Uh, once you have gone through your checklist and you know you wish to mint DOIs and you are a not-for-profit organisation within Australia or you're publicly funded, um, you can register with ANS to mint a DOI. And how you go about that is you contact our services division and to register you'll need a DOI account name, which would normally be that's a, the name of your organisation. You can provide us with an IP address or a range of IP addresses or a list of ranges of IP addresses of the organisation machine that will be used to mint the DOI through us. Now, this is not compulsory anymore as of our last release of the service. However, it is used for the authentication to make sure that the registered organisation is the organisation attempting to mint the DOI. We also need a contact name of a person responsible for the DOI registrations from an organisation and an email address for that person as well. When a DOI is minted for an organisation, uh, it has to be known in advance what domain the resolvable URL is in. 
and that top level domain must be provided as well to register the site my data service. It's not only ANS that wishes to know this, but data site themselves um, will not mint a DOI with the resolvable URL or pass that does not belong to that top level domain. It's another security feature. Uh, once registered, the organisation will have access to Mint DOIs through ANS API. However, initially, they will only be able to do so with what's called a test prefix. And this is 10.05027 at the moment, I believe. This test prefix, it will be used in our production system. It will Mint DOIs on the data site production system. However, uh, periodically, data site will go through and just wipe those DOIs. It's just a proof of concept for your organisation to integrate the Site My Data service within their organisational data management flow. For a client to implement, they will use their ANS provided authentication details. When they uh, apply for registration to use Site My Data, a client will receive an app ID, which is a 32 character long unique identifier. They will also receive a what's called a shared secret. If they don't wish to use the IP range for their authentication, they'll use a shared secret, which will they'll use the authentication of the HTTP service to uh, pass that through. And they will access the endpoints of, of URLs. Now, I've provided an endpoint here. It's long and looks quite confusing to most, probably. It's services.ans.org.au slash DOI 1.1 refers to the version of the service we're using. The word mint refers to the activity we wish to do, which is mint. The variable response type will be the response type that the organisation which is to re receive back from Site My Data Service. That could be JSON, it could be a string, or it could be XML. They must also pass along the service point in that URL their app ID and the URL, the resolvable URL of the DOI they wish to mint. What they also need to provide to mint a DOI is data site XML. Data site have their own schema of their XML, and that XML will describe the data set. It will describe, most importantly, the title, the creators or authors, uh, the publisher, which is usually the organisation in which it will reside in, and the year of the publication. They must provide, these are compulsory data site XML parameters, but you'll also know that these are quite, quite accurately with the um, norms of citation. Uh, as mentioned previously, clients will initially be allocated a data site test DOI prefix 10.5072 for their testing and implementation. The DOI example that Jerry put up previously was uh, 10.54.026 probably. It had a slash, a 01, a slash, and then a unique um, character. The 01 will refer to the client ID that we, as ANS, give our organisations that we register. I don't know which client it is, but it's not us. We have a zero, zero. And that will allow people to easily, without using a name of an organisation, to easily identify which organisation has minted that DOI. Now, when clients are ready to start minting production DOIs because they've proved that their implementation method is true, they'll need to sign with ANS a Site My Data Participation Agreement. The bulk of that agreement will be that the institution agrees that they will make sure that that data is persistent. It is their responsibility to ensure that that DOI is always resolved. Um, once signed, they send that agreement to ANS, and once ANS has agreed that yes, it's all, everyone's working well, then you'll be assigned a production DOI prefix. For ANS, we have three production DOI prefix that data site have allowed us, and 10.4.26, 25 and 27, I think. However, once minted under the production prefix, those DOIs will never be deleted. So they always must be maintained. And that really is a big component of that data site agreement. Um, but how to implement, I've rushed over it, I know, because I don't know how many developers are out there, and I'm pretty sure you don't want me to start speaking too many acronyms at you. But um, we have a fairly extensive document on how to implement the Site My Data service, and that can be found on the ANS website cmd-technical-document.pdf. Now, I did mention that data site XML must be passed to the minting service. There are compulsory elements that must be passed in that, of that XML. Now, the first one I've listed, the URL isn't actually part of the XML. That gets passed on the command line perimeter. However, it is compulsory. Title, 
creators, publisher, and publication year are all compulsory elements of that XML. They must be included. Um, if not, it'll just fail the schema validation and it won't mint. That's an example of the XML. It's just it's letting you know that it's the data site schema that it, it gets validated against. At this instance in here, it's uh, version three of their schema. And you can see that publication year, publisher, title, and creator are all there. It's worth noting at this point that uh, a lot of our first adapters of the site My Data uh, were confused that they had to provide two ANDs, a different XML schema. They were very used to our RIFCS schema, which is our way of describing a data set. However, because we are minting DOIs, we need to have the data site XML. It is possible in some instances for us to generate a data site XML from a RIFCS schema especially if a contributor in their RIFCS object have used the citation metadata element and filled it out. And people who have done that will recognise that the elements within the compulsory elements within the data site schema match up quite neatly with the RIFCS citation metadata schema. There is no thought in process at the moment, however, that we are going to go and run through our RIFCS and develop data site XML for users. So just a little summary on how you would approach using the Site My Data service. You'd have to contact ANS to talk about the service and send the account information described to us. You then have to use your own developers within your own data repository methods to automatically, from machine to machine, mint DOIs through um, our ANS service. You do so at first with the test prefix. Once that has been proved, you would then sign a Site My Data participation agreement, and that agreement would be sent to ANS, and then you'd be given a production prefix and be able to meet production DOIs for your data sets. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, due to client request, ANS developed also a user interface into the Site My Data service. What this user interface currently will do is will enable a client to list all the DOIs minted. Uh, it'll be able to ensure that the URL that they provided whilst minting their DOI is a resolvable URL. They'll also be able to click a button and they'll have in front of them the data site XML for that DOI. They can also update the URLs for their DOIs through this application. They can also check that all the DOIs minted by them are resolvable and have a report sent to the email address that was provided during their registration process. They could have a look at their registration details and they can also view the activity log of every time they've minted, updated, activated, deactivated a DOI. And as of yesterday afternoon, we had 27 organisations or clients who have registered with DataSite via us to use the Site My Data service. And those clients have minted 2,343 production DOIs through our Site My Data service. And that's it for me. Great. Well, thanks very much, Jerry um, and Liz. It's great to have sort of a discussion about the advantages um, of, of data citation and DOIs, but also the nuts and bolts of how that's done. Um, we're now going to uh, have have an opportunity um, for our audience members to uh, ask questions of Jerry uh, and Liz. So I'll just read um, verbatim. So first question we've got is, Jerry seems to be saying that DOI should resolve to metadata, whereas my experience with persistent identifiers, handles, is that they would typically be resolved to the digital object itself rather than the descriptive metadata. Do we then need two separate persistent IDs, one for the metadata and one for the actual research data? Jerry, is that something that you could um, offer some advice on? What we would generally recommend is that a DOI would resolve to a splash page or a metadata page. What we find is that with research data, what people commonly want is for people to be able to see things like license conditions, access options, citation requirements, the sort of information that's contained within a metadata page, uh, rather than perhaps taking somebody directly to a data set. I mean, that is possible, but um, the preference is generally that it would resolve to a splash or metadata page that describes the data and the conditions around the, 
uh, reuse of the data. So you wouldn't necessarily need to have two persistent identifiers. What you would do is ensure that the DOI associated with that metadata uh, page, that you uh, maintain the resources so that you would still have access to the data. And it's probably also worth mentioning that in some cases DOI may resolve to a landing page that actually describes a physical rather than a digital object or that describes how to access data rather than giving you direct access to the data. So in some cases you may need to register first, you may need to contact somebody if there may be some ethical requirements around access to the data. And this information can all be provided on the on the metadata page. I hope that's answered the question. Thanks, Jerry. Um, it, it sounds like it would have, and, and we have the opportunity if, if people want a follow up question to that, um, please do type in. I'll, I'll move to the, to the next question we have now. Uh, do handles, as opposed to DOIs, have any disadvantages in terms of data citation metrics? Uh, that is, can either be used in alt metrics or TR? Data citation index, for example. So, what's the I suppose what's what's the advantage of of, a, of minting a DOI over a handle over another handle? I guess the the DOIs seem to have have emerged as I guess the gold standard or the preferred persistent identifier. If you look around at many of the data repositories, you'll see that they assign DOIs or that they prefer that you assign a DOI. You can see how well established DOIs are in the journal community. So they've really emerged, I guess, as the gold standard. And therefore, it is preferable if you are able to mint DOIs and assign them to data. Uh, that is preferable. In our dealings with people like Thomson Reuters, who have developed the Data Citation Index, they will accept records that don't include a DOI, but they have stated that they would prefer a DOI. Um, I think it's because they are guaranteed, globally unique. They have this implication of long-term uh, persistence and maintenance. So certainly for those sorts of providers, DOIs seem to be the preferred uh, standard. Thanks, Jerry. I'll move to the next question um, again. Are there any issues to consider if you have a range of producing organisations in your data collection? So I, I imagine that means if, if your data um, collection involves a number of organisations or institutions, what through which institution or organisation would you um, would you meet the DOI? What we what we say, I guess, in general, is that if the data is a result of collaboration, then uh, it really needs to be decided. Uh, I guess a bit like when you're publishing a journal article, um, who the uh, lead person is, or who has the capacity to publish and perhaps assign a DOI to the data. So certainly you would want to try and avoid situations where the same data set is published multiple times and assigned multiple DOIs uh, through that process. That's really not particularly desirable. So really in those cases it would come down to having that conversation amongst the collaborators to, to determine who will publish and who will assign a DOI. Happy to talk to people offline if they've got specific questions don't get covered today if I've misinterpreted. Thanks, Jerry. That sounds like a really helpful option um, as well. Another question. Uh, for a single experiment with several associated data sets, is it preferred practice to mint a single DOI or mint multiple DOIs per data set? Is it possible to have sub-DOIs? This is a question I've heard before, so this is um, obviously a, a, a popular one. Yeah, yep, this does come up about, I guess, the granularity of what you assign a DOI to. And what we try to encourage people to think about is the granularity at which the data is likely to be reused and therefore cited. There may, all be, may also be some very practical considerations. Um, I was speaking to somebody recently who's involved in managing a lot of astronomy data. 
the practicalities of assigning DOIs and being able to guarantee and maintain those DOIs at a very granular le level just you know, wasn't going to happen. So a decision was made to actually assign a DOI at a higher level. So it does really depend a little bit on the discipline and what the expectations are of the reuse and the citation. And it is possible, if you have a look at uh, the data site metadata guidelines, it is possible to cite subsets of data. So if there's DOIs assigned at a quite high level, you are able to cite a subset within that DOI, within that level. So there are some options there and you know, there's some also very practical considerations around um, being able to guarantee that, that persistence and maintain DOI. Thanks, Jerry. That's, um, that's a, yeah, a great and a really, really um, extensive answer to that question, which, as I said, does come up quite a bit. Um, I've just got a follow-up to um, an earlier question which you answered as well, as well. So just to follow it up, because people might still be thinking about this. So just in relation to the question of if you've got a range of producing organisations for your data collection, um, the follow-up question being, so does that mean that, does that mean that the organisation meeting the DOI is considered the publisher? Or can you distinguish between the data producer uh, and the data producer or owner and the DOI minter? So the data site metadata schema, which Liz described as the mandatory requirements, does allow you to describe a number of roles apart from the creator and the publisher. And I guess it depends, so you, that is possible to describe that through the data site metadata schema. It's also possible to describe that in your metadata page or your, or your uh, splash page. Uh, so I guess it depends on uh, whether you're wanting to use this for tracking reuse or to ensure appropriate acknowledgement of the owner as opposed to the publisher or the creator. Um, but essentially, the publisher is the organisation that takes on that role of long-term custodianship of the data and the release of that data. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, this, this next one might be a question for Liz. If an organisation is already minting DOIs for publications uh, through other means, do you think it would be worth separately using Cite My Data to mint DOIs for data? Absolutely, mainly because they are linked to data site. That's where your XML will be stored, and data site themselves are now set up almost to people will go and search there to find information about particular data and data topics. And it's designed for citing data. I would highly recommend that an organisation, even if they are minting DOIs for journals, would still come to cite my data, or another organisation that may work through data site to. Mint DOIs for their data. That's a big yes. Next question is, what would the format be for citing a subset within a data set? So would it be similar to a book chapter within a book or journal article um, within, sorry, or journal article within a journal? So this, this comes down to sort of citation conventions or whether there, there is currently a convention um, for doing that. Uh, yeah, there are there are some conventions uh, that you you can have a look at some examples at, at the data site metadata schema, and I'm happy to talk with whoever asked that question offline if if they've got a, a specific use case or example that they might like some assistance with. We've you know, looked at examples with people um, where a subset may actually be something, what, what you're actually citing is perhaps the, the, the date and the query against a database uh, that, so that where the data may be updated or it could be something that's more analogous to that example of um, you know, a book chapter or you know, pagination within a journal article. Uh, it really depends on the type of data um, and uh, I'm happy to sort of Talk about some. It will talk with somebody about specific examples. It sounds helps. like it, it might be quite variable depending on um, on what kind of data it is. So, um, yeah, yeah. So if people want to want to contact um, that very generous offer of Jerry to contact her directly. She can provide some examples or guidance on that. 
Um, that seems to be the, the end of, oh no, apologies, here's another question. Um, can a single DOI be used for ongoing research data or is it, a, is it preferred practice to meet a new DOI upon release of a new, of new data associated with the experiment? I guess this is a, a very um, pertinent question yet, for example, in, in repeated or longitudinal data sets. Um, and again, a, quite a popular question. I've heard it myself a few times, so I know Jerry has a good answer to this one. So there's a couple of ways of, of looking at this, and again, it's a little bit dependent on the type of data and how you see it, see it being reused and what commitment you're able to make to the you know, minting and maintenance of DOIs. But in some cases, people um, choose to assign a new DOI. If it is, for instance, a longitudinal study, you know, cut off at, depending on what it is, but perhaps on a yearly basis, uh, time slice that and assign a DOI to that, uh, and then you know, do the same thing uh, year in, year out, uh, and package those up, say, as, a, as an annual data set and assign a DOI to that. In other cases, it may be a data set that continues to grow over time. Uh, it may be um, so. It may not. It may not be something that you wish to sort of wrap up in a in an annual snapshot. And in that case, you might assign choose to assign a DOI to the data set as a whole, and again ask people to cite uh, the say the date and time that it was accessed when they actually took some of the data out to reuse. So uh, again, there can be multiple ways of looking at this. And um, we've seen, you know, examples of both ways being of both ways being um, implemented. Thanks, Jerry. Um, this next question, I think, we'll we'll call to Liz. If we are minting DOIs through ANS, what will happen if ANS funding ends? So, will we work directly with data site? Yes, that's possibly what would happen. Every data centre that we have registered with data site do actually. Um, have their own then account with DataSite, and as ANS at the time of registration was a member, that DataSite will honour to those data centres, and they will be able to access DataSite's API to continue to mint and run. Great. We just we did have a question um, earlier on, um, and I might just ask for a bit of uh, clarification from um, the participant who asked that question because we were just not sure whether it's in relation to an earlier question. Um, would it be appropriate to add a comment based on experience? For example, uh, don't include a readme um, dot text file. So, sorry, can you just re repeat the question? Sure. Oh, sorry, you've lost it. Yes, yeah. It looks like it might have been in relation to another question. Um, would it be appropriate to add a comment based on experience? For example, don't include a readme text file with the data. Perhaps if the participant um, uh, who highlighted that question might add a little bit of context around that, we could, um, we could offer an answer. And if they're, if they're not, to perhaps contact, um, contact us afterwards. Mm. I mean, there's, uh, I guess just in general terms, there's uh, absolutely no reason why as part of a data collection or data set that you wouldn't include a readme uh, file that actually can be quite useful in providing uh, greater context than can be provided perhaps in a simple metadata record. Um, and in some cases, those readme text files, you know, provide information about software versions that you might uh, need to reuse the data or tools that might be available to reuse the data, how to cite the data. So there's, um, it, it's, it's certainly very acceptable practice to include that sort of information as part of, you know, wrapped up as part of a data set and, and to provide as much context uh, information with the data as you can. Thank you, Jerry. Um, as I said, I, I hope that's answered the question. Um, okay, we've just got a couple of new questions that have come through. Can more than one unit within an institution or a university get their own DOIs? Or is it at the university level? I'm not sure this sort of comes down to the same part of uh, the discussions we have between a group and an institution with the RIFCS. That would, I'm sorry, that's a, almost a political um, 
eggs that you'd need once you'd had the discussion with the end services team, I think. I think the preference normally um, is to have one per institution where possible, uh, but I think we've seen some instances where there's more than one. But I think um, I think the preference is uh, one per institution where possible. Another question: Is there a process or requirement for checking if a DOI already exists in relation to? No, if you're going to use uh, my data, we do the checking for you. And in fact, we actually allocate the DOI to you. And that um, non-representative string at the end is always going to be unique, as in you cannot mint a DOI that's already there. It is possible, however, if the question is meant, that you can have two DOIs that have the same resolution point, which is obviously something you want to avoid. Um, and that would be a mistake in your implementation. Is I'm not quite sure which way that question meant, as in duplicate resolving or a duplicate DOI itself just can yeah, I think I would have yeah, yeah. Um, and, and a comment actually from another um, ANS member in relation to to the reading the text comment would be um, which is which might be helpful as well for the participant. It would be good if the README um, was made accessible via a URL and then the metadata page could link to it. So like like the related info element on the Research Data Australia review. Thanks for that comment. Um, and just an update on that question again. So some clarification around the original question. Um, was it the participant meant if the data exists in two places, it might already have a DOI? Ah, this might, I should hand over to Jerry probably. I think we've had a discussion similar about amalgamators of data. So the data itself may exist in two places. And I'm not quite sure what decision that Yeah, was. and if, if it's already been assigned uh, a DOI in one organisation, say somebody deposits the data in, let's say, the Panjaya data repository and it gets assigned a DOI, and then uh, someone wants to publish or, or, or expose the same data through another repository, perhaps an institutional repository. Uh, yes, ideally you would reuse the DOI assigned by Panjaya rather than generate a new one. So in that sense, I guess if you suspect that the data has already been assigned a DOI or published elsewhere, it would be worth um, checking um, so that you can uh, reuse the existing DOI uh, rather than create a new one. You don't really want, you know, it's not ideal to have multiple copies of the same data published in, you know, if you if you, if you think about it in the same way as other types of scholarly outputs, um, it's not, you know, it's preferable to not have multiple copies of the same data uh, itself published, but you could have many metadata records um, describing the data that point to a reference copy. We seem to have come to the end of, uh, of our questions, so we might wrap up there. If there was um, any further clarification um, needed or add-on questions, do feel free to contact them. Um, and at this point, um, we'll say a big thank you to both Liz and Jerry um, for offering their expertise today, and um, and thank you to audience members for for your questions as well. I think that's that's really clarified a number of issues um, for everyone. Hopefully, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.